Good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome back to Online Calvary Cork Services. If you are a member of our church fa family, uh, we miss you, and we long to see you very soon, God willing. If you're a guest and you're looking to know more from, from Jesus, you've come to the right place, for Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're going through a very tiring season where everyone is looking for some rest. Things are changing very quickly. There are a lot of unresolved questions. But remember what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our God is the same no matter what season we're going through. For those who are sick due to the ongoing disease, Know that God loves you and he has a purpose for you and for your life. May I invite you to come to worship God because he deserves glory and honor, no matter what we're going through. Uh, to the children, I know this is a, it's, it's hard to see the sermon online, but may I encourage you just, just to enjoy your time with your parents, have a good fellowship and just come to rejoice and, and worship the Lord. So Psalm 47 says, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud, so with loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with the Son. Father God, thank you so much for this day that we can come to worship you, Lord. We worship you for who you are. You deserve glory and honor. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and gave himself for us. May he receive the honor today, Lord. I pray also for those who are sick that you may come to heal them, Lord. And finally, I pray that you will speak to our hearts today, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jody. I head up our women's ministry here at Calvary Cork, and I'm bringing you our announcements for the week. So um, uh, Wednesday night on the Calvary Cork Facebook page, 7 p.m., uh, the Jonah study continues with Jonah chapter 3. Um, so do come along to that. Um, then on Thursday at 3 p.m. our um, Lighthouse Beacon is on the Calvary Cork Life Facebook page and you can replay that um, if it's not convenient for your family to watch it on Thursday. It'll be there for you to, to watch whenever you can. And then Understanding God is starting up again and um, meeting at the YMCA 8 p.m. Friday the 23rd of October. Um, so that's great to have that ministry starting again. So um, that's it for announcements for the week. Um, God bless you all. Enjoy your Sunday. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be able to worship with you this morning. We are going to do three songs. So I would just really encourage you just to worship the Lord wherever you are. You know, it could be in your sitting room, in your bedroom. Just give it all over to the Lord this morning.
find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Cause when we see you, we find to do is King of Kings. Oh, 
church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not need and shall not fade By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the blood of Jesus Christ next song we're going to do is Promises.
can gather here this morning God we may not be able to gather in person it may be online God but you still deserve all the word all the the honor and praise this morning and I pray now that you would just um open our hearts open our ears Lord to hear what you have to say to us in your holy name we pray amen and we're going over to Crystal now to hear our scripture reading for this morning thanks so much Emma Hi everyone, my name is Crystal and I'm going to be doing the Bible reading for today. So if we could all turn our Bibles open to John chapter 12, um, I'm going to be reading from verse 12 to 19. So verse 12, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This concludes our reading of scripture. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now over to Mike. Hey, good morning. And a big thank you to Crystal for uh, doing our scripture reading and also to Emma for leading us in song. So my name is uh, Mike Neglia. I'm here with my son, Finn. Finn, can you say hello? Hello. And can you say Hosanna? Hosanna. Can you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? <laughs> okay. And can you wave your little palm branch? Okay, so Finn is going to join me as my little assistant uh, for this morning. I realize that there are families watching this at home, and there could be kids sitting on a couch just like this uh, during uh, today's message. Um, maybe they're watching the Lighthouse Beacon replay, or maybe they're on a couch just like Finn right here. So again, thanks to Crystal. Thanks to Emma. Um, thanks to all those that are participating in today's service, one way or the other. Okay, so the passage that we have in front of us is uh, John chapter 12. Uh, this is a famous one. This is one of the passages of scripture that gets a lot of attention. It's part of our annual church calendar. Uh, this is called uh, the Palm Sunday passage. So oftentimes... Uh, my book for that's okay. So oftentimes in, in churches, and, and we often do it ourselves, um, the Sunday before Easter, um, we look at this passage. So this might be familiar to you. In fact, it was six months ago that I stood awkwardly in this room and did the Palm Sunday sermon. Maybe some of you can remember it. Uh, maybe some of you can't. But now I'm awkwardly sitting in this room doing another Palm Sunday sermon. So, I mean, isn't it great how all this is coming, coming together? Okay, so in the passage, we have Jesus coming from Bethany and going down the Mount of Olives and then coming into uh, the ancient city of Jerusalem. Um, this is recorded not only in John 12, 
but also in all the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke also record this event. So we have like a wealth of information about what takes place. Like I said, this is referred to as Palm Sunday. Some people will call it the triumphal entry. That's how the ESV titles uh, this section. Um, John 12 is, of course, going to be the main section that we look at, but I'm going to be pulling in things from other passages as well. So you know this because we've been studying through John. You know that earlier in Bethany, Jesus did like his most public miracle in the whole book of John. He raises Lazarus from death. And then in chapter 12, we saw this last week, um, Lazarus's family, they celebrate. And there's this great dinner that is thrown in his honor. It's uh, hosted by a man called Simon, and everyone's there. There, we have this very like private um, act of worship as Mary anoints him and pours out the oil um, upon his feet and his head. And then what's going to take place in this section is a very public acknowledgement of who Jesus is. Matthew 20 says that as he is coming in towards Jerusalem to uh, make this entry into the city, that there's two blind men that he heals on the way there. And, and I can't help but just think that, that the first thing that they see is Jesus' face. And the first thing that they do is they follow him. So there's like this, this crowd coming from Bethany to Jerusalem, and it's kind of picking up steam. And then also there's a crowd from Jerusalem of people that are there for the Passover celebration. They hear about Jesus coming, and so they come. So essentially we have like these two different crowds coming together. There's Guys, there's zero social distancing. Um, it's pre-COVID. There's a crowd gathering all around Jesus. And, and again, I like to imagine this kind of stuff, so just bear with me. Like imagine there's those two men, and they've been blind, and they are like in the crowd and like literally they're taking it all in. Their eyes have been opened and they see Jesus and now they quickly follow Jesus. And then they're, they're saying hi, they're, they're introducing themselves to the fellow Jesus followers. Um, they're saying like, you know, hi, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. And then maybe they bump into Lazarus and Lazarus says, you know, that ain't nothing. I once was dead but now I am alive. So they're coming into Jerusalem to join up for this Passover celebration. We'll talk about this a lot in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're entering into Jesus's last week before his death upon the cross. And so there's the passage, you heard it. There's a large crowd gathering. And just like Finn, they gather these palm branches, they tear them down, they shout Hosanna. Shout Hosanna. Hosanna. Shout a little loud. I know you can shout. Shout Hosanna. I can't shout. Okay, he said it already. So they're shouting Hosanna. Other gospel writers tell us that they're also taking off their outer garments. They're placing it on the ground before him. It's just this big event. The Pharisees, the people that have been like plotting Jesus' demise already, you read about it in the last couple of verses of John chapter 12. It says that they're just like so frustrated, so infuriated. They're like, Ugh, see, I knew it. Everyone is following Jesus now. So here's the big idea. That's, that's kind of the main story. I'm gonna pull out just a few different thoughts that can be useful to us in these strange days. Here's thought number one. Oftentimes, we don't know what really is going on. Our lack of understanding does not impede on Jesus' ability to accomplish his will. That's the, first, that's the first thing I think it's important for us to know this morning. Oftentimes, we don't know what's going on. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is, look with me at verse 16. <laughs> I, I identify with this a lot. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. All right, so, so many times... We see the followers of Jesus, like not just like the large crowds that follow Jesus because they were there, but also like his closest guys, 
like his small tight circle of apostles or disciples, oftentimes they're uninformed or they're just plain misinformed. Um, they're lacking understanding about what is taking place. And we always encounter Jesus as completely aware, totally capable, wise, and he's sane in a world of insanity. Now, just that reality of the contrast between the lack of understanding and knowledge on the one hand and the complete embodiment of wisdom and knowledge in Jesus, like that can just be a source of comfort for us. I want to read a, a passage from the prophet Isaiah. This is a famous one, just reminds us of the character of God. He says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So guys, there's, there's the reality that God's thoughts are so much higher. His knowledge um, you know, is, is uncontainable. And here we are just struggling along. Um, here is uh, a quote from the New City Catechism. Um, question two, this is a section from it. The, the question is, what is God? And it says, God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. But look at that. He's eternal and he's infinite in his wisdom. Like there is all that we know is our own frailties and limitations. And when we consider just the infinite wisdom of God, I, I wanna apply this, okay? Because these days, there is so much speculation taking place. Um, there is misinformation that's going out. There is uncertainty. Um, conspiracy theories are flying, you know, and conspiracy facts are out there as well. Um, who knows? But there's daily briefings that many of us are tuning into, and those briefings are even subject to change, or they're out of date by the time you wake up the next morning. So there is so much that we don't know. And today we encounter someone who does. So here's some kind of simple realities. Jesus knows more than you do. Uh, number one, I mean, uh, we read elsewhere that he knew the location of the donkey that he was to sit at. Matthew 21, verses 2 and 3. He sends the disciples in to a certain place to find a certain donkey, and they bring it to him. And he knows in advance where to find it. Um, later on in this same week, he shows that same foreknowledge or omniscience regarding the upper room arrangements, where they're going to have the Last Supper together. Uh, and these examples kind of like hyperlink or remind us of all these other examples of his superior knowledge or his divine attribute of omniscience on display. John 2.24 tells us that Jesus knows the hearts of all men. Uh, there's times when Jesus encounters even his opponents, the Pharisees, and he knows what they are thinking even before they say it. Jesus knows which of the disciples would betray him. Uh, Jesus knows which of the disciples would deny him and also would eventually be restored. Uh, that's why the Apostle Paul later writes that Jesus is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So guys, in, in times like this where we don't know what's going on, we know this fact that Jesus knows more than you. It's not groundbreaking, but I believe this can be very applicable to us in October of 2020. So if this is true, and it is, here's what it means for you and me today. Uh, this means that uh, the one whom we worship is completely knowledgeable. So that means that we don't have to worry about something catching him 
off guard. That, that means that nothing is unforeseen nor surprising to the God whom we serve. Uh, that means that for us, that our plans are written in sand. And we have this illusion that we are in control or that we know what's going on tomorrow. But lately that illusion has been removed from us. But Jesus is never surprised nor caught off guard. He is entirely trustworthy. And because he is entirely trustworthy, that means that we can trust him even today, even now. As you're watching this from your couch, as you're watching this on a phone, if you're joining us on Sunday morning for the live broadcast that's coming out, or if you're catching up later on, you can trust him today. He is preeminently wise. And that means that we don't have to lean on our own understandings, but in all of our ways, we can acknowledge him and allow him to direct our paths. Romans 11.33, the Apostle Paul just kind of bursts out with this. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable are his ways. And so this knowledge that, that God has, this unflappability, this um, wisdom that he has, is not only about the big picture on what's going on in the face of the earth, but also in our solitary, isolated little lives. Um, they're still within his purview. They're still under his care. Um, remember in the very beginning of, of John, there's a passage that, uh, that Rick uh, preached on a Sunday morning. Um, Jesus introduces himself to Nathaniel, and, and he reveals to Nathaniel that he even knew what Nathaniel was doing when nobody else could see him, when he was self-isolating, when he was social distancing, when he was all alone, Jesus was aware of what was taking place. Um, there's a passage up on the screen right now. Uh, look at what Jesus says there in the middle. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So oftentimes we don't know what's going on, but Jesus knows more than you. And not only that, let me remind you a second thing from our passage today. Jesus is the culmination of a plan that spans the ages. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that Sunday is part of the eternal plan of God who organizes and orchestrates all things according to the counsel of his will. So he is the culmination of a plan that spans the ages. So the reason why Jesus told the disciples to go get the donkey and the colt and, and the reason why the crowd um, waved the palm branches um, is because this is all coming together to fulfill this ancient prophecy about the arrival of the Messiah. Oh, now you're coming back, huh? <laughs> you wanna wave the branch? Yeah, keep it going. So this goes back to about 520 BC. So a long time before this ever happened, um, during a time when Israel was just like totally chastened, um, totally humiliated. Hi, mommy. Hi, mommy. When they are... <clears throat> So, like, Israel had been, like, defeated and cast out of their land. They're hoping and looking forward to a time of eventually coming back. And um, Zechariah, the prophet, speaks these words of, like, comfort and encouragement to them, um, telling them what God thinks about their current situation. Um, he, God is going to give judgment against the persecutors, and he also promises them the Messiah that is going to come. But he says that the Messiah is going to come at a time that you don't expect, and he's going to come in a way that you don't expect either. So you can read about this in Zechariah 9. That's what's quoted here in this passage. And he says this, 
they were hoping for a pageantry of power and might and this like impressive looking Messiah to come rescue them. What Zechariah tells and what Jesus fulfills is that the Messiah that's going to come to them, the rescuer, he was going to come in humility, in lowliness, on a mission of peace. So when we think about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and everyone is so excited and the palm branches are being waved, it's it's nearly a comic scene because they're making such a big deal over him, but he is on this incredibly humble mode of transportation. You know, if you watch the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy or or read the books, you know, you know that there's Gandalf. And Gandalf has this like majestic white horse called Shadowfax. Um, or you could even think of uh, Aladdin and his grand entrance into the streets of Agrabah. And he's on the back of his, you know, elephant. And everyone is just so impressed by his like stature and this like power move of showing up, making an entrance into the city on an elephant. You know, so in the ancient world, in this part of the world anyway, um, kings would come in on a horse when their purpose was to wage war. Or they would come in humbly on a donkey when they come in peace. So Jesus deliberately fulfills Zechariah's prophecy that there is this lowliness associated with the the coming king. And he is the one who is going to end war and to establish this universal peace. Around Christmas time every year, we often consider that one of the titles of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And here we see the Prince of Peace coming into a world of conflict. I I like how uh, Dr. Ricky Woods puts it. The entry into Jerusalem shows that Jesus will not avoid places of danger or dangerous activity if both reflect he is doing the will of God. John's gospel clearly points to Jerusalem as a place of danger for Jesus because Jerusalem is the place where the Jewish opposition to Jesus's ministry is the greatest. And and Jesus is not one to shy away from danger. And here he comes into Jerusalem and it might be said, and he's never coming back. Now, obviously, we, we do know, but we know that his death awaits him there in Jerusalem. We know about the hope of Easter, and we know that all that's taking place. But on a human level, his entrance there is going to lead to his execution. He's riding on a donkey, on a donkey's colt, so a, a young donkey. The other gospel writers tell us that um, this cult had never been ridden before, hadn't been broken in. But there, when Jesus sits upon it, we see that there is this calmness. Um, so the same Jesus who calmed the stormy seas is also able to calm the cult and be carried in on it. Okay, so interesting this connects to ancient prophecy being fulfilled. That's interesting, you might be saying. But what does this have to do with me and my life? Well, I'm glad to ask. I'm glad you asked. So remember, in our time, in October of 2020, we don't know what's going on. Things seem to be spinning out of control. But remember, God has a plan that spans from the beginning to the end, from the Alpha to the Omega. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is not sweating bullets on the throne of heaven right now. He is not pacing back and forth on the halls of his royal palace. He is not wringing his hands hoping that things are going to turn out okay. He has a plan. And my friends, God has a track record that we can trust. There's a song that we sing sometimes that say, you know, you've never failed me yet. And he has not failed you, nor any of his children. 
The same Jesus who calmed the sea, the same Jesus who calmed the donkey, uh, can also, if you ask him, calm you with this morning's reminder of his big picture plan. So Jesus knows more than you. Jesus is the culmination of a plan that spans the ages and includes today. And thirdly and finally, I want to just point out, it's never the wrong time for you to praise Jesus. It's never the wrong time. The crowd is moved to this like spontaneous eruption of praise and these declarations of their allegiance and their loyalty to Jesus. Now, I'm looking around for the palm branch, but it's, uh, I think Finn took it with him. So the palm branch that we read about there in chapter 12, um, this is like this, um, for them, this is like this nationalistic uh, symbol. Um, it'd be, you know, it's somewhat akin to like the waving of a tricolor or any other um, national flag, um, but it's not a neutral act. Um, for them, the palm branch was a symbol of like um, independence from Rome. And they were waving those in hopes that Jesus would be the one who liberates them from their Roman oppressors. It has connections to the Maccabees. I can, I'll put a link because there's, there's much more that could be said than I have time right now. Or that you care. <laughs> but anyway, it's the symbol of, of Jewish independence. And they're waving that. And it definitely means something. So that's their, they're pledging their allegiance to him. They're saying, we want you to, to, be, to be our king. Um, in addition to that, Matthew 21 says that they were like taking off their, their outer garments, their, their cloaks, and they were laying them down beforehand, before him. So making this path like a, like a red carpet, like we want you to come in to the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus was on a donkey but they're saying, like, not even the donkey's feet should touch the dirt. I'd rather my clothing be sullied than the feet of the animal that's carrying you um, should walk upon that dirt. This is something that is similar to their declaration of kingship of Jehu. You can read about that in 2 Kings 9.13. I recommend that you just jot that down in the margin of your Bible here and check it out later on. Um, but giving their clothes up, allowing their clothes to be dirty, it's this real symbol of honor. You know, all of their clothes were like artisan and handmade back then. There was no mass production of anything. A cloak was a costly uh, uh, bit of thing. And they, they say, you know what, I'm going to lay that down. Doesn't that remind you just of last Sunday? Doesn't that remind you of what took place as Mary in Bethany took her costly ointment her spikenard oil, and says, I want to honor my Savior. I want to honor Jesus, the resurrection and the life, by just laying down something valuable to me at his feet. And so too here, they take their cloaks off and they lay them down at his feet. And then finally, they're quoting these psalm lyrics. It comes from Psalm 118. It's a fantastic psalm. It's quoted often in the New Testament. And it's a psalm that Jesus quotes himself um, later on in this very same week. It's a song of celebration and reunion after deliverance from enemies. Um, it's assurance of God's presence in the midst of crisis. And so I want to kind of assign this to you. Read Psalm 118. Um, it says this, this wonderful verse that's applicable to us now. Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9 says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And then later on in that same psalm, it says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So they're quoting that. They're crying out. They're saying, save us. Is that your cry? Is that 
Is that the cry of, of Cork? Is that what people are, are hoping for? Some kind of deliverance, some kind of rescue? Like maybe it is. You know, some people are saying, you know, deliver us from COVID-19. Maybe some people are saying, deliver us from government overreach. Uh, deliver us from the fear mongering and the divisiveness that's taking place. Uh, save us from the coming or implied economic fallout from this. Save us from loneliness as um, people are not even to visit one another anymore. Um, save us even from the, the fear or the anxiety that some of us would have of not enough ICU beds and all the kind of stuff that we're reading about on the news. So we have all of these concerns and in the midst of all that, like let's just hear this news that it's never the wrong time to, to praise Jesus, even in the midst of um, conflict or fear or concern. Um, it's always the right time to trust Jesus, right, Rosie? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and elsewhere, um, again, Luke's gospel tells us that as they're crawling out this Hosanna, save um, message to Jesus, they're acting as if he's their king and they're asking him to save them and rescue us. The Pharisees tell him, like, essentially, like, would you hush up your followers? Would you tell them to be quiet? And Jesus says, you know what? Like, if I tell them to be quiet, like, even the rocks are going to call, cry out. Um, there's some circumstances where Jesus, like, must be praised. Um, so even in a time when it might seem, like, counterintuitive or silly or just plain too hard to praise Jesus. Let me say it's never the wrong time for you to praise Jesus. Um, there's a song that we've been singing. Um, Shar led us in it last Sunday. The song says, I won't let the rocks cry out in my place. We return the breath that you gave to praise. Um, so if you're concerned, if you're scared, if you're nervous, if you're frustrated, if you're um, upset, well then it's never the wrong time to praise Jesus. Let me put it the other way. It always is the right time to praise Jesus. So in just a minute, Emma's going to come back and lead us in some songs and take your frustrations, your fears, your concerns, um, and turn them into praise. That's my encouragement to you. So here's, here's what we've seen so far. Jesus knows more than you. And that's a good thing. Jesus is the culmination of a plan that spans the ages, including today. And it's never the wrong time, time for you to praise Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rosie, let's, um, let's pray, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, God, we commit ourselves and our families, um, all those that are watching this in Cork City and Cork County, and even beyond, we want to commit them to your knowledge and your wisdom. We acknowledge um, your plan. You have a plan that included 520 AD and the triumphal entry and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus and so much more. And Lord, you have a plan for our October. Um, and then also, God, we want to consciously offer our praise to you. Just as they... Um, you know, unbutton their coats and they decided to lay them down. I pray that you would, um, as it were, just like loose our throats and our mouths. Help us with our, our voices or our actions or our private devotions to praise you even in the middle of troubling, concerning times. Do you want to pray anything, Rosie? You sure? Okay. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so thanks very much um, for joining us. Um, and do you want to say bye, Rosie? Bye. Okay, Finn, you want to say bye? Bye. Okay, so now we're going to go over to Emma, and I believe there's um, two songs uh, that Dad, we're going to be able to, I to sing. I was just to nuts. And then Octonauts. Thanks, Mike. We are just going to do two more songs now together. In Christ 
song we're going to sing is Great Are You Lord. Free. 
we give you all the honor and praise. You are a great God and we thank you for speaking to our hearts today, God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to remain in your peace, God, even though we're in circumstances that are far from peaceful, God, but we give it all to you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Um, for our benediction, I'm just going to read out Philippians. No, so it's um, chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, and present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or, or praiseworthy, think about such things, whatever you have learned, are received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. I hope you have a great Sunday and a great week. God bless.